Hi, Felicia. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a joy to have you here this morning. You, I am happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. It's a very strange kind of celebrity you have. You talk about it in the in the beginning of the book. What's it like being so recognized by some and not recognized at all by others? I definitely say in the book that it's a ping pong ego uh, trip <laughs> where you can go one place and hundreds of people are kind of clamoring for your signature and pictures with you. And then others, you try to like pull that card. Hey, do you know who I am? And they have Absolutely no idea. <laughs> it seems ideal, though, doesn't it, that anyone who knows you is probably going to like you and, and, and those who don't know you are just going to leave you alone. Absolutely. I think fame is something that we think we want, but when you get it, uh, even a slice of it, it's not it's not the, the cup of tea that you might uh, think. I've always had friends who were in science fiction shows where they got to wear makeup uh, in their everyday life, and it's the best part because when they have the makeup on, everyone knows them, and when they don't, um, no one knows who they are. And that's kind of what internet fame is in a way. If Freddy Krueger could be here right now, we'd have no way of knowing. I hope he isn't here. Unless he looked like that in real life. Yeah, That'd that be would be awkward. So you were homeschooled uh, as a kid, which is brought up. And also, I, I think that you may have had the earliest uh, – uh, experience with the internet that I've ever come across in my entire life. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I think my book, and I didn't know this until I started writing it, but um, my story and, and life kind of parallels the emergence of the internet. My grandfather was a nuclear physicist, so he was very tech savvy, even in the 70s. And um, that's where the internet started, scientists talking to each other um, through the very, very early sort of telnet, even pre-telnet mm-hmm. days. So um, we always had a computer in our house, and my parents had a CompuServe account way before Anyone really knew that you could connect with people online together. And uh, I watched that dial up, that 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 <laughs> old modem sound when I was a very small child and, and, and saw my parents connecting with other people through that computer. And that was a thread that I uh, connected with throughout my life. Well, what was it about talking with others online, even at a very early age, that really appealed to you? Well, I was homeschooled, as you said, and I didn't really have any friends around me right. other than lessons and community theater. And so when I got the opportunity to uh, log on with a, an account on a prodigy, which is what, uh, like a flat rate account that we could log on every day um, for a monthly fee, my brother and I connected with people instantly um, through bulletin boards and our love <laughs> of video games, uh, the Ultima series. And that really was uh, the first time I felt like I belonged and who and felt at one with myself because I was enjoying something with other people who enjoyed that thing too. Uh, speaking of prodigy, uh, yeah. you, went, enough bad. you went to college when you were 16 years old. You did a double major in music and math. You got a 4.0 grade average and you were a gifted, gifted violinist and you still play. I, I, I watched you uh, on YouTube last night, looked up some of the videos and, and saw you play. Beautiful. What made you decide after all this music, uh, math, uh, you know, again, prodigal intelligence, what made you decide to go to Hollywood to become a, an actress? Um, well, you're making me blush, but uh, <laughs> I always did uh, theater wherever I moved. So my dad was in the military, so we moved quite a bit, and that was one of the reasons I was homeschooled. And wherever I go, I would look into the free newspaper or the bulletin boards, and I would join whatever community theater was going on. So I played the fourth Can Can Girl from the Left many times, uh, <laughs> Orphans and Oliver. I was never really the star of the productions, but that was okay because being a part of that family and making a play together uh, really was a very fulfilling experience. So I always had that idea in the back of my mind after school when I got my fallback degree on math, which I loved as as well. But I always knew I wanted to go to Hollywood and just join a show. And (laughs) it was not, it was very naive, I have to say in retrospect, but I I had it in my head. and And as soon as I got my degree, I was practically on a bus going to Hollywood, waiting to be discovered. <laughs> you wanted to make a big in vaudeville. That's I great. did. Great. I wanted to play on a show. It was not successful. So you went from theaters to Hollywood TV projects, and then you found your way to independent or indie web projects. Yeah, Why? I, yeah, I was an actress for many years, and I, I played all my bills. I, I actually had a career, right. and it was not a full-time career. That's kind of the irony that people don't know, that most actors don't work every day. Uh, I think 90% of the actors in SAG don't actually make their living acting. Mm-hmm. They have other jobs. They work a couple times a year, and that kind of qualifies them for health insurance, but not much else. And that's the the the, the kind of career I had. I paid all my bills, but I only worked a little bit, and it was very unfulfilling. And I started filling my time with uh, video games instead because that was something I loved as a kid. And, and it got to the point where it became an addiction. And uh, in order to get uh, a hold of my life again, I decided to quit those, quit, quit doing that and uh, started writing. And I decided to write something about what I loved, which was gaming, online gaming. And that's how The Guild, my show that I wrote and produced and acted in for six seasons, uh, came to be. I'm speaking to internet superstar Felicia Day. Her new book is You're Never Weird on the Internet. 
Almost. That's called a reset. How about that? Hi, Not yeah. bad. So you've had a huge success online, first with the comedy series The Guild, uh, about gamers, and then through your geek, uh, geek and Sundry web entertainment company. What do you think, though, out of all the channels and all the countless videos online, what do you think has been the secret to your success online? I think the my success has been always thinking about what my fans would like. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people try, try to come to the web and think it from the external. How do I get people to like me? How do I make viral videos? Yeah. And, um, you know, I've never had a background in PR or marketing. I've always just thought, hey, if I was a random fan in Ottawa or Oklahoma, what would I like today? And really, that's that's really the impulse. I love making people laugh. I love creating community between people, not just about myself and my work. I love the idea that a community can spring up where people feel like they're they belong. They they're going to like Cheers. You're going to a club um, or a bar that you like every day to enjoy content and, and share that content with other people. Now you mentioned earlier, and I think this is very interesting. Uh, there have been dark periods. You mentioned your addiction to uh, online gaming, and a lot of people think that you know that that seems like a very not necessarily real addiction. But we all know. I mean, you and I both know. I know people who have been very severely addicted to World of Warcraft. How serious a problem did you have playing online games? You know, I don't blame online games inherently. I think that I needed something to change in my life and I wasn't willing or ready to change. And I used the band-aid of gaming to fill the hours that I was unhappy, not really uh, content with what I was doing with my life. Um, So, you know, I think uh, I just sort of kept filling and filling and filling until I was playing 14 hours a day mm-hmm. and 12 hours a day and I was sleeping and dreaming about gaming and um, I'm I'm very I'm very glad for the hours and the time that I spent with my guild and the people and the connections that I made there that are I still have friendships from but I allowed it to get out of control um, and not dealing with the problems in my life and when I put a stop to it and started applying myself in a more fulfilling way around gaming, really, that's when I really found happiness. Was, was there a moment, though, when you realized this had gone from something that's fun to do to something that had become a problem? Yeah, I had people in my life telling me, hey, um, you might want to maybe show up to a class, <laughs> acting <laughs> class, or right. not skip auditions, or spend some time with real people. And um, when it started becoming a point where I knew that I was unhappy, but I just played anyway because it sort of soothed that sort of unrest in me, um, that's when I knew I needed to stop. And do you feel that you're you're over it now? Do you do you still log on every now and then? No, because every day I wake up and I make content and I I, I celebrate the things I love with the people in my community and my friends and yeah no I have meaning in my life around the things that I I do um, a, on a deeper level and uh, I don't really have the time for it <laughs> but when I do play games online with my friends or streaming them um, with my audience I love every minute of that and that's what gaming can be it can be a community builder it can be a joy of um, escaping and imagination and uh, that's that's what I channel that's how I channel it now I, I do want to step into maybe the, the dark side of gaming just for just for a moment because uh, as an online celebrity you've had your fair share of trolls and a, and a lot of people would think that the worst you can get on the internet is people arguing in the comment section of a news article but you've had to deal with very s- severe problems with trolling on the internet what's what's the worst you've had to deal with you know there have been um, many people who uh, I think the, the most hurtful thing is when people attack you for your authenticity mm-hmm. and your um, um, things you can't control, like your gender. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, the whole reason I found belonging on the internet was because I felt like an outcast and I, f- I felt like I was weird. Right. And to be to encounter that online with people trying to um, paint a paint a brush, you know, paint me with a brush of of e- either ignorance or just plain um, prejudice. That really hurts, especially since gaming is a place where I found like I belonged. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, wherever in life um, you're going to find rejection, you're mm-hmm. going to find people who try to make you other. I've seen comments um, in videos of friends of mine that say, hey, you're too pretty. <laughs> you know, right, I right, mean, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if you're going to, if there is the capacity to make you feel like an outsider, someone on the internet's going to try to do it. And it, and really, it's about their own unhappiness. Yeah, and, and, and the idea is that the you're too pretty to have actually have interest in the things that I'm interested in. Exactly. And I think that's coming from a, a, a sense of insecurity on, on those other people's part and maybe maybe being uh, painted as an outsider in their real life and rather than try to co- uh, create positive connections they're they they're in an environment either online or offline uh, that makes them think that they should create negative connections. And ultimately, the more you can put uh, more time you can put into positivity, the better because no matter if you're the proactive negative person or the receiver of negativity, it doesn't make anyone happy.
Uh, the, the most terrifying thing I can think of on the internet, and, and it's happened to people, is doxing. The idea that your home address, your home phone number, your cell phone number, your credit card information, your driver's license, all of these things are posted to be available online. And, and you were you were once, uh, I don't mean to bring, bring this up to bring back bad memories, but I think that people don't necessarily realize how serious it really is. And you were doxed. I mean, how do you deal with that? I mean, that was a very scary incident, and it actually, as I used to talk about in my book, happened to me a couple years ago and then recurred because that information was always there. Right. And um, I think that using that as a weapon against people is illegal, and it should be prosecuted because really, unless there are repercussions, anonymous people are going to do what they want to do, either through their own anger or um, just ruthlessness. And it, what, whatever field you're in, um, I think you should be protective of your uh, online information because a lot of us don't know— um, that if you Google your name, you can find out a lot about yourself. Mine took a lot more digging, but mm -hmm. um, I had people showing up my house, and uh, you know, it, oh, you know, it it can reach. And I've I've experienced and and, and seen other people um, have their financial records um, and uh, destroyed. So it really is a serious thing that law law enforcement um, should uh, look into on that end. But as far as like online bullying mm -hmm. and um, uh, that kind of thing, really, that's something that unless you really use the, the tools that the platforms are uh, available to you to kind of censor your world in a way, uh, to be protected uh, emotionally, um, you know, you're going to be vulnerable. But what I love is that you, you don't just say these things have happened to me and, and very poor me. You, you, you talk about ways we can get through it and you, and you talk about what has dealt with you and so that people don't feel so alone. And your book, I have to mention, includes a chapter about, about Gamergate. Now, Gamergate, the online movement kind of known for harassing women who have spoken out about sexism in the video game industry. And I'm sure I will be tweeted about for saying that. But <laughs> you write that you expect there will be another flood of online attacks because you've included Gamergate in that chapter. Uh, why was it important, though, for you to write about it? Actually, it was um, uh, just another step in a chapter I already had um, in my book about negative comments. Yeah. Uh, a, a majority of that chapter actually was already in the book. Yeah. And after I finished my draft, uh, that incident happened and it was very unfortunate and hurtful and most hurtful other than just the personal um, uh, issues. Um, it was, I think, a very bad um, thing for gaming because that's not what gaming is and should be. It should be an environment and a hobby that includes people. And as it grows in popularity, um, it should uh, welcome new perspectives with open arms. And for some reason, um, there are some people who don't like that um, evolution and uh, and addition of outside voices, um, you know, being included. And it's so interesting to me that other people's perspective is so um, motivate so motivates people to lash out in such an aggressive way. I think um, the the more diverse opinions about something, the better. The more we can uh, learn from each other, and um, you know, especially the personal hateful things about people. Uh, the things that people can't control, like their race and religion and their sex. I think that's uh, particularly just a negative and, and not what I want an outsider to know about gaming. Gaming is amazing. It's an entertainment form that's going to evolve and include more uh, kinds of media as we go forward. And I would love for it to be a place where people feel safe and invited. I love that at one point when I was reading your book, I was like, I was really tempted to play this game <laughs> while, while I was reading. I was trying to play this game called Rocket League, which I'm playing a lot right oh, now. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. very popular and, right now. And uh, and I was like, no, 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 she's talking about how I have to focus on this. <laughs> she's, she's, I'm learn, trying to learn lessons from the book. I do want to end on a positive. I want to talk about something that happened to you at George Lucas's Skywalker Ranch. It involves a prop from Star Wars. I love the story. Tell me about <laughs> what you saw and how it blew your mind. Well, I was privileged to have a fan who worked for Lucas, um, and uh, I got invited to take a tour wow. of uh, some of the original archives, and I was uh, blown away, uh, not only because I'm seeing history, but because of what was done um, before there was any CGI. I mean, uh, the backdrops of the original Star Wars are painted on um, shower stall walls. No like way. glass walls. They have them all in a row and they're shower um, walls. They're, they're glass and they're painted in minute detail and the ships are absolutely the most realistic thing you'll ever see uh, in paint. Wow. So that blew me away. But, you know, as I was browsing the props, I saw um, something that looked like a little grenade and I I looked closer and I was like, what is this? And my guide was like, oh, that's, um, I believe it was a bomb or something from a scene for, on Tatooine. And, and she said, yeah, so they ran out of uh, budget in uh, the original Star Wars, and Lucas traded the merchandising rights to be able, and for him investing personally into the movie because right. he believed in it so much. And because they were so bare bones and it was his own dime, um, they had to use whatever means to build the props, and that is made of Dixie cups. <laughs> and I was like, this is less than a penny. 
And this was in the biggest movie Dixie of Cups, all time. Dixie Cups in one of the greatest films ever made. Yeah, yeah. and it just showed you that if you have um, a story that you want to tell, there are ways to tell it in any any format, and it, it can change the world, a Dixie Cup. And that really is the spirit of the web. All the, you know, I think if the web were existing when he was trying to make his movie and there were no other ways, he would make that movie on the web. And I love that revolutionary spirit, and I see people every day um, uploading videos that really are going to change the face of entertainment. And the next Lucas is going to be from the web, and I'm, I'm privileged to have started there and stay there. I, I do want to end. It's a, it's a wonderful and candid memoir. Thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, what are you hoping that readers, gamers and non-gamers, uh, people who are on the internet, people who still read newspapers, what do you hope they take away from your book? Well, I hope they laugh because it was it is a funny memoir because I'm inspired by Tina Fey's Bossy Pants mm-hmm. to try to make something that's uh, um, uh, something that means something to people but also funny. Uh, but primarily I want people to embrace their weirdnesses. The, the way I grew up is very odd and made me feel like an outsider a lot. And um, the feeling of being an insider, wherever you can find it, is something that gives meaning to your life. And whatever makes you different, uh, don't give in to peer pressure, especially when you're growing up or even as an adult, to conform. Because the things that make you outstanding will be the things that lead you to your greatest happiness. Thank you so much for coming in, Felicia. Thanks.